Thaddeus Stevens was a giant among men. Stevens was a champion for individual rights. And, uh, you know, and that's why some people hated him. Oh, I think he felt everyone should be equal. Everyone should have the opportunities, the same opportunities to, to grow and to progress and, and to be who, who they felt they could be. Um, here you have a major figure in mid-19th century politics, um, arguably one of the most effective legislators uh, and politicians in American history. Uh, and not too many people know about him. He is the greatest unknown person in American history. With all the accomplishments associated with Thaddeus Stevens, you have to wonder why he's so overlooked in American history. We hope to share with you the insights and perspectives of some of the foremost authorities about Thaddeus Stevens to find out more about this man. The unveiling of a new life-size statue of Thaddeus Stevens in front of the Adams County Courthouse here in Gettysburg solidifies the valuable legacy of Thaddeus Stevens. The impetus for that statue comes from a group of historians and scholars committed to preserving the life and legacy and his place in American history. I'm Ross Hetrick, president of the Thaddeus Stevens Society, a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting the legacy of Thaddeus Stevens, the most powerful congressman during and after the Civil War. Thaddeus Stevens grew up in Vermont, but moved to Pennsylvania following his education. He taught briefly in York and became a successful lawyer in Gettysburg, where he served several terms in the Pennsylvania State Legislature. He later moved to Lancaster and represented that city in the U.S. Congress. While serving in Washington, he became one of the most forceful and influential opponents of slavery, espousing a dogged commitment to the concept of equality for all people, regardless of race or economic standing. He ushered through the 14th Amendment, which is the, one of the most significant amendments to the Constitution. For he also was uh, instrumental in the passage of the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery, uh, which is actually shown in the movie Lincoln, where all men are created equal. It is a uh, goal that we have had for hundreds of years in this country, and Thaddeus Stevens, I would say, was the great apostle of equality. A nationwide search for a sculptor for the project led the Thaddeus Stevens Society to Chattanooga, Tennessee. World-renowned artist Alex Paul Loza, a native of Peru, became enamored by the life of the man whose image he was commissioned to create. Well, something that I like to do before I create a piece is really immerse myself in who the person is. And the more I found, the more I wanted to know more about him. And something that came across throughout all the research was that he was a, a type of person that he was always moving forward. It, it didn't matter what was across or what was standing in front of him, he would find a way how to like go over or just move forward, right? And, and that's what I wanted to capture with this, this sculpture. His expression, uh, I wanted to show that he was determined. But the head is a little bit tilted because it, like to show that he was ready to listen. He was gonna use it to defend the powerless or, or, or to um, fight for them. So it was looking forward, but without forgetting of listening to his people. I was very happy to come across a person like him, that knowing that a uh, hundred plus years before I even I arrived to this country, or I knew I was going to create something like this, that there was somebody like him fighting for everybody. Uh, this statue is really unique because it's really uh, in motion and he is clutching perhaps his greatest achievement, which is the 14th Amendment, uh, which is the most significant amendment to the Constitution that requires equal treatment under the law and also extends civil liberties to the state level. So it's going to be, it should be like a little history lesson in itself. Stephen spent about a third of his life here in Gettysburg, becoming heavily involved in the community, professionally, politically, and economically and demonstrated his prowess as an attorney. Thaddeus Stevens was an incredibly good attorney. During his time in Adams County, from 1816 to 1842, he was the attorney of record in more than 3,000 civil cases. The success of Thaddeus Stevens as an attorney was the bedrock of his financial success 
from which he could leapfrog into politics and into real estate. He was of great memory. He could easily see the finer points of the case. He usually came into court with no notes. He insisted upon taking the evidence of his own witnesses prior to coming into court. He made his money as an attorney. But one case he took on early in his career, in which he argued successfully on behalf of a slave owner, led to his feeling remorse for winning that case, in which a mother, Charity Butler, was returned to slavery in Maryland and separated from her husband and two young children. After that, it's believed Stevens pledged to never again allow his courtroom ability to contradict his core beliefs against slavery. He must have had incredible guilt because this was something that he was involved with. After the Charity Butler case, Thaddeus Stevens never again def defended a slave owner against a slave or brought suit on behalf of a slave owner against a slave, never again. And for the next 47 years, he embarked on a crusade for equality, a crusade to end slavery, first at the local level, then at the state level, and eventually at the federal level. And eventually, he won. Stevens' success as an attorney helped to finance numerous property acquisitions in Gettysburg, including a farmhouse which became Robert E. Lee's headquarters during the Battle of Gettysburg. During his lifetime, he owned 90 properties. He owned the property around Caledonia Iron Furnace, including the Iron Furnace, and at his death, his manager said they owned around 18,000 acres. He had 30-some houses, he had uh, 17 barns, he had outhouses, he had uh, orchards, he had three uh, iron properties, he had a rolling mill, he had a forge. Uh, he owned a lot of property. On land provided by Stevens, Gettysburg College was established and he served on the trustee board for 34 years. Some of his properties became commercial or industrial establishments that provided employment. The best example is the Caledonia Iron Works, today part of a popular state park, which employed several hundred people and had the largest black workforce of any employers at the time. When Caledonia was burnt to the ground by the Confederates on the way to the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, Thaddeus Stevens' first concern was with the people who lived here and he uh, continued to pay them, even though he wasn't getting any uh, income from it until he was able to rebuild the uh, furnace. He was here right before they came, and he uh, went off to Shippensburg to escape, but uh, he, he commented and he said, I understand that they were very disappointed that I, he understood that the chivalry was very disappointed that I wasn't here. And uh, then when he uh, heard about the burning, he said that they burn the debts also. The ownership of multiple properties, both here in Gettysburg and later on in Lancaster, coupled with his ferocious opposition to slavery, fueled speculation that some of the places he owned were likely stops on the Underground Railroad. There was uh, a uh, Underground Railroad trail in the west of Adams County along the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains uh, and Stevens owned many properties along that Underground Railroad and it's alleged that he told the people who had a mortgage with him or who were renting from him that this is what they do and they would keep quiet and so there are a number of properties, I've visited a number of properties with a history of being uh, an Underground Railroad station. Uh, the Underground Railroad was clandestine, but it was also fairly well known, in some, not necessarily here, but uh, we know from uh, some records, a man who escaped was told to come to Lancaster, come down from the train station, which was at that time two blocks away, and that they would find assistance 
at the office of Thaddeus Stevens. Several years ago, while renovating Thaddeus Stevens' former office in Lancaster, archaeologists discovered an underground cistern between a tavern and Thaddeus Stevens' office that looked suspiciously like a hiding place for runaway slaves. We found a cistern, which again wasn't necessarily unusual. We were expecting to find things like this when we excavated in the courtyard behind Thaddeus Stevens' house. But this particular cistern had been modified, and we could date the modifications pretty cleanly to the middle of the 19th century, probably the mid-1850s. Someone built a passageway through the cistern or into the cistern, as the case might be, uh, and that passageway led through a, 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 a gap between two foundations in what we call now the Kleist Tavern building, so that a person could climb with relative ease between the basement of the tavern into this abandoned cistern. Uh, and we, again, date this to a period where we believe that uh, Thaddeus Stevens and Lydia Hamilton Smith were living in Lancaster. This was in a time when he was no longer serving in Congress. Uh, at that time, he was practicing law and living in Lancaster. And our conclusion was that they had made these modifications specifically to hide something in the cistern. And uh, we have concluded that it was likely used as uh, an escape room, if you will, or a safe house for um, African-American people escaping from slavery uh, in the South up through the North. Uncovering the past, uncovering the past of such prominent people um, was, was absolutely you know, an archeological dream. But what was even more striking, I think for us, um, because we were very much on public display in downtown Lancaster, um, the dig was, was open air. Um, we attracted so much interest. Um, the community was so interested in what we were doing. And the appetite for both archaeology and the material legacy of Thaddeus Stevens and Lydia Hamilton Smith was so powerful. Lydia Hamilton Smith was a confidant of Stevens who helped to keep his financial records and managed some of his properties. Initially, his housekeeper turned out to be his business partner and uh, she helped him with his business. She was there. She accompanied him on his trips to Washington DC. She was there in the home. She ran the home. Um, and again, he assisted her in, in purchasing properties and she owned a boarding home in Washington DC, which was almost unheard of for not just a woman, but particularly a woman of color. She played a critical role in managing Stephen's schedule his, his household, but also kept him alive in the closing years of his life. We might not have had the 13th and 14th Amendments if Lydia Hamilton Smith had not been caring for a man whose body was literally falling apart. And here she is um, picking up the pieces and keeping him able to get to Washington to do the work that needed to be done. In a victory for historic preservation, the building that housed Stephen's office was preserved and saved from demolition in the early 2000s, based on the archaeological discoveries and the records of O.C. Gilbert, whose first-hand account of Stevens' assistance was the proof needed for historic preservation. Now that we have this property as being designated as an authentic safe house of the Underground Railroad based on one episode of a formerly enslaved man, his brother and, and associates coming here in the late 1840s, and his testimony, this formerly enslaved man, O.C. Gilbert, knocking on this door and being invited in and given uh, food and directions to the next safe house of the Underground Railroad, which is six miles to the east of here, is enough that the National Park Service designated this site as what's called an, a site in the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. That and the advocacy of several prominent community leaders and two community newspapers opened the door for creation of a museum to honor the legacy of both Thaddeus Stevens and Lydia Hamilton Smith. It will be created by Lancaster History, a prominent preservation society. This is where they were engaged uh, in underground railroad activity. Um, but this is a story of national importance. Uh, those amendments did not apply just to Lancaster County or to Pennsylvania or the Mid-Atlantic, but they changed the way the law lays across the land. Um, and uh, that makes this a remarkable national story at a time, I think, when the nation needs to excavate from its history, where are the examples of people who were highly principled, who fought 
with integrity and determination, and sometimes with terrible sarcastic wit. Um, anyone who knows Stevens knows he, he was a powerful orator, but also could cut you down, um, but usually for good political purposes, as I'm sure he would, he would say. In keeping with the spirit of Stevens, the new museum will meet the highest standards of accessibility in terms of accommodating physical needs and historical integrity. Stevens didn't have the advantage of the electronic age of recording and broadcasting his every word into homes on TV and social media. But those who heard him speak say he was a master at communication. People who heard Thaddeus Stevens in the State House of Pennsylvania and in Congress said he was spellbinding. Spellbinding. His oratory was incredible. I would just like to read you one section to give you an example of his speech in 1834 that helped turn the tide to get Gettysburg College their appropriation. Stevens said, bring in a bill to improve the breed of hogs. The gentleman would be enthusiastic in its favor, but attempt to improve the race of man and it costs too much. I know how easy it is to float down the sea of ignorance into the sea of popularity. Its waters are so dark and deep as easy to buoy up the light craft that embark upon its surface. But shall that sea forever roll between us and knowledge? Shall there not some voice be raised within these walls sufficiently powerful to command even that sea to roll back its waves and stand like a wall upon either hand until this people are led out of their present darkness into the land of light and knowledge. Stevens' legacy is in stark contrast to the other native son of Lancaster and contemporary of Stevens, James Buchanan, the 15th president of the U.S. and a formidable political rival. In this community, to realize you have these two powerful politicians, both attorneys, both practicing in the same town, but more politically opposite than you, you could imagine. Uh, and we've got an opportunity in a, how many communities are there in the nation that have two pivotal leaders living in that same community and acting on the national stage at the same time? I can't think of many. Um, and especially to tell such a remarkably different set of stories about the same issues um, that led to the Civil War and, and post-Civil War. A defining moment of Stevens' legal career was when a slave owner came to Christiana, Lancaster County to apprehend his runaway slave. Local people resisted and ended up killing him. Stevens took the lead in defending them against treason charges. They gathered up most African Americans in the community. Um, they arrested formally 35, and, as well as four Quaker gentlemen, and took them to prison in Moyamansing to hold them for treason, which was they used because they stood against a federal law. And that's when Thaddeus came here. He actually spent three days here in this hotel interviewing people uh, to get the full gist of the story. And he did very well. He used the the opposing side, their own views on, on the African Americans. They said, oh, if, how can they possibly be so intelligent to come up with such a, a plan to resist against these slave owners? And uh, when it was all said and done, it went to the jury, and in 15 minutes, they came back with a not guilty verdict. Thaddeus Stevens' commitment to equality led him to become a champion for access to education. One of his legacy achievements is helping Pennsylvania stay committed to free public education. The 1790 Constitution mandated free public education in Pennsylvania, but an 1809 law only offered it for free if you classified yourself as a pauper. That was changed in 1834 to give free access to school for all children. The problem was people soon realized it was costing them a lot more in taxes. State legislators then proposed a bill to repeal that free access provision. The Senate passed that uh, repeal, but when it got to the House in the uh, Congress of um, 1835, um, a lot of people were opposed to it. They didn't want to repeal it. 
And it culminated uh, in a speech by Thaddeus Stevens, which many regard as maybe his greatest speech, but certainly one of his greatest speeches, where he tried to show that uh, it was actually less expensive to pass this bill than go back to the 1809 bill, plus indicated that it was much better for society to have an educated population and that we should repeal the act and go back to the... the um, the Free Public Education Act that had just been passed. He got a, a standing ovation, the local newspapers and people felt that his speech was so eloquent that it was the difference and that's why he's deemed the savior of public education in Pennsylvania. He advocated for the poor, the downtrodden, the oppressed, um, those that were discriminated against. And I think it all goes back to his childhood. Thaddeus Stevens was born in 1792. Uh, when he was born, he had a club foot. That physical disability, his club foot, is often referenced when trying to explain why he had such a passion to advocate for those at the bottom of the social ladder. Because of his disabilities, he was concerned about others who had less visible disabilities, African Americans, for example, and he believed everyone should have equal access under the law. And, and of course, that wasn't the case uh, during his lifetime because of slavery and other forms of discrimination. So I think he projected some of the, the deficiencies in his own life and said, I'm gonna help offset those at other people's lives. He realized that you can't judge a person by what you see. You have to get to know a person and understand a person. Uh, Stevens went on to Dartmouth College where he was the poorest uh, student there who was discriminated against. Uh, even though academically he qualified uh, for induction into the honorary, he was not admitted. He didn't have money for books or anything. He attributed education as the great equalizer and the reason that he was over, able to overcome the circumstances of his lives and become successful, and he wanted that for everyone else. So I think that's the reason that he not only supported the Public Education Act, but he was a founding member and certainly a, a driver in the establishment of Gettysburg College and, 30, and certainly Thaddeus Stevens College and many other education initiatives. His assistance to create what has become Thaddeus Stevens College is another of his greatest legacies. It's now a successful trade school in Lancaster, begun with a gift from Stevens' will designed specifically for indigent orphans to teach them a trade. You know, he endowed $50,000 at that time to create a space where, uh, where students can learn. Uh, to learn a trade to, to a livable pathway, but most importantly, regardless of race, regardless of religion, he wanted them to be able to sit at the same table and eat together and be created equal. And that's the legacy we continue here on the college. Well, his life was very specific, wasn't it? I mean, being an abolitionist, um, you know, fighting for, for equal education and, and educational opportunities for, for free of students, um, you know, to, to build up, you know, trades and, and opportunities. He was a very, um, you know, specific advocate and a champion for, for the less fortunate. There was another specific directive that Thaddeus Stevens issued while he was still alive, and that had to do with where he was to be buried. Thaddeus Stevens selected this spot because this is a location back in his day where people of different races could be buried. That was the only cemetery that would allow blacks and whites to be buried together in the same cemetery. He wanted to leave a lasting legacy of the message of treating people equally and equitably. So this is a final resting place for him for that reason. And he wanted to make sure that that point was made even when he was laid to rest. His funeral was attended by thousands of people, a large percentage of whom were black. U.S. colored troops escorted him from Washington where he died to, to his gravesite in Lancaster and he was honored every year thereafter. Uh, they had many, many events honoring him and what he did and what he stood for. For years after his death, the only group that really honored his memory were African Americans. They would make pilgrimage to his grave in Shriner Cemetery, and they'd hold speeches uh, about the great commoner and what he had done for democracy in this country. But in his day, Thaddeus Stevens received mixed reviews. As endeared as he was to champions of equality, he was hated by those who were determined to preserve slavery. His parliamentary maneuvers in Congress almost single-handedly kept the Southern Democrats from re-establishing laws that essentially institutionalized slavery even after the Emancipation Proclamation. 
He succeeded in arranging for a close friend named Edward McPherson to be the house clerk, whose job it was to call the roll at the beginning of each session, a session in which Southern Democrats were intending to reverse the outcome of the Civil War. What happened was after Lincoln was assassinated, the uh, new president was Andrew Johnson, a Southern Democrat. And he allowed the, uh, the Southerners to hold elections, and they elected Confederate officials and military officers uh, to Congress. And they planned uh, to uh, join up with their Northern Democratic uh, allies, and basically they were going to reinstate slavery. What they, uh, the 13th Amendment outlawed slavery, but there was a loophole because uh, it said that involuntary servitude is illegal except if you're a convict in uh, prison. So they just made all black people convicts. They said if you step off your plantation and you don't have a job, which of course they wouldn't, you're a vagrant and can be put back onto your plantation as a uh, uh, convict. Uh, involuntary servitude. Edward McPherson called the roll, but excluded the names of the Southern Democrats. That prevented them from voting. If the uh, Southerners had taken their seats, there would never have been any reconstruction and there never would have been a 14th Amendment. Because of his legislative genius, Thaddeus Stevens is credited with saving African Americans from a return to legal slavery, which has been termed the second American Revolution. His idea was uh, to basically, and I think this stems from his early career as a teacher, he wanted to teach them a lesson. He wanted to take away the land from uh, the aristocrats and to redistribute it to the uh, freed blacks and the poor whites uh, so that they had a more of a yeoman uh, type, yeoman farmer type system rather than the aristocracy that uh, prevailed in the South. He wanted, despite his harsh language, he just wanted to make the South a uh, equal society. And, uh, you know, he just, and teach them a lesson. The groundbreaking movie Birth of a Nation in 1915 portrayed him as an evil, spiteful, corrupt politician and villain. He was a victim of what is known as the lost cause uh, mythology. Uh, which was uh, perhaps the most successful propaganda campaign in human history where the losers of the Civil War who were fighting to uh, destroy the country and retain slavery have some, somehow turned this around to be a noble cause. And they also had to have a fall guy, and the fall guy was Thaddeus Stevens, and uh, he was the villain in uh, two movies that promoted the uh, lost cause mentality. And in one of those movies, uh, the, vil the heroes were the Ku Klux Klan. Also, he was not necessarily a pleasant person if you were his enemy. He had an acerbic wit, and, uh, and people don't like uh, smart Alex. Stevens also falls victim to a tendency to focus our attention in American history on presidents, not members of Congress even though Thaddeus Stevens' influence was just as important, if not more so, in shaping American society. Thaddeus Stevens uh, is one of the underappreciated heroes of 19th century America. Uh, he took what we had as a wonderful document, the Declaration of Independence, and he helped operationalize it. Not everybody believed, quite literally, that all men are created equal. Thaddeus Stevens believed that. And Thaddeus Stevens spent much of his political career and his political capital and his energies trying to make America live up to its own declaration of independence, its own promise of equality for all Americans. Thaddeus Stevens made a difference. He was a biting speaker, but he was a pragmatic politician. He was a person who was in the vanguard for racial justice in this country. He pushed people like Abraham Lincoln hard to move further, to move faster, to realize the promise of the Declaration of Independence. And as a result, we have a better country. One intentional characteristic of the sculpture that illustrates Thaddeus Stevens is the way his coat appears to be flowing in the breeze, as if Thaddeus is moving forward against the prevailing winds of thought of his day, all the while clutching a copy of his signature achievement, the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, that guarantees equal rights to all Americans. The man who designed the sculpture says that was intentional.
he put his entire knowledge and all his his energy on fighting for this so he can give freedom uh, well freedom for the uh, slaves but also give them the equal rights and then I think he was also a person that was like ahead of his time like he was thinking ahead of how this um, amendment can benefit others in the future so I decided to put him like grabbing that so tight and really close to him because he was going to do everything possible to make this happen. When Winston Churchill passed, Leo Strauss spoke of a profound obligation to remind ourselves and our students of political greatness, of human greatness, and the peaks of human greatness. More than 150 years after the passing of Theodore Stevens, we're still reminding ourselves and our students of his unsurpassed greatness. One of the basic conflicts in American history has been over property rights and individual rights. Uh, what the South fought for was property rights. They, they believed that they could own people. And Stevens was a champion for individual rights. It's important that we uh, honor the uh, uh, legacy of Thaddeus Stevens because it is an important legacy of the United States that while we had the sin of slavery at the beginning of our uh, country. We also had people fighting it from the beginning of our country, like Thaddeus Stevens and uh, the slaves themselves. Uh, and this was a coalition that eventually succeeded in uh, uh, bringing about a more equal society. And so I think people should take uh, inspiration from that and continue to maintain and uh, uh, pursue an equal society in the United States. Make a big thank you to all of the people who have uh, contributed to the statue uh, and also to the people who contributed to promote or to hold this three-day celebration of Thaddeus Stevens uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, and also the people who contributed to help make this video. I hope that this uh, video and the dedication will uh, bring more people to realize the importance of Thaddeus Stevens. Uh, and to uh, hopefully support efforts to promote his memory. The Union side of Civil War was blessed with two political geniuses, Lincoln and Thaddeus Stevens, and part of Lincoln's genius was that he listened to Thaddeus Stevens. Uh, this was really clear to people at the time. When Lincoln came uh, into office, he did not uh, expect to be getting rid of slavery. He uh, was only wanting to contain slavery to the southern states and stop the expansion. Uh, but as he went along, he was persuaded by people like Thaddeus Stevens and Charles Sumner that the only way they were going to win the war was to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. And that was something that Thaddeus Stevens pushed all the time about uh, this was the only way that we were going to win the war was to free the slaves and then put them into the military. And that's exactly what won the war. But it was a, a very long slog uh, for uh, Thaddeus Stevens to convince uh, Abraham Lincoln that he was going to do this, but at least he convinced him and uh, he just followed on. One particular uh, observer at the time said it was if Thaddeus Stevens was going through a field, clearing the field, and that, that, and that Lincoln would come behind him sowing the uh, seeds of freedom. So it, it was, it was a, you could say it was an antagonistic uh, relationship, but it was a good antagonistic relationship. Well, it came about with using the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. A slave owner used that, that act to 
retrieve what he deemed to be his property by getting the legal documents together and coming here to Christiana to retrieve that property. And he was met with resistance. Um, there was a group here that they said they had found their freedom and they would, by their own right arm, help anyone else maintain their freedom because they actually work, get paid, have days off, raise a family. It was, it was as it should be. Um, when the slave owner came, he demanded his property. He was told uh, people were not property, and if he wanted property, he could go to the barn right out there and get some cows and chickens, because that's what property was, uh, which incensed him, and after much dialogue, a shot was fired from his party, um, which set the whole thing off. Um, the home he was at was the home of William Parker. Parker's wife, they had a signal ready that if any trouble came up to show the, the community that they needed help, was blowing a fish horn. So when that shot was fired, she ran up to the third floor of the home, blew the fish horn, which was the signal that they needed help, and thinking this was four o'clock in the morning, um, in a valley, and it's dark, and not like we have today, the traffic. So I'm sure it was heard for miles, but people came to assist. And uh, sadly, when the dust settled, it was just the slave owner, Edward Gorsuch, that was dead. And uh, of course, they brought in militia and everybody else, and they gathered up most African Americans in the community. Um, they arrested formally 35, um, as well as four Quaker gentlemen, and took them to prison in Moyamansing to hold them for treason, which was they used because they stood against a federal law. And that's when Thaddeus came here. He actually spent three days here in this hotel interviewing people uh, to get the full gist of the story, and then he became their, their co-defense. And how did he do? Oh, he did very well. He enlisted the help of, of a phenomenal lady called Lucretia Mott, who was an abolitionist in, in Philadelphia. She got her ladies auxiliary together. They made clothing for all the African-American prisoners, dressed them all alike, blue overalls, white shirts, red, white, and blue neckerchiefs, and sat them all together in the courtroom. And to add further insult, Lucretia pulled up a chair and sat with them, and she knitted throughout the trial. But with Thaddeus's help, um, he did very well. He used the, the opposing side, their own views on, on the African Americans. They said, oh, if, how can they possibly be so intelligent to come up with such a a plan to resist against these slave owners. And uh, when it was all said and done, it went to the jury, and in 15 minutes, they came back with a not guilty verdict. The Charity Butler case was an incredibly important case in his evolution of thought regarding slavery. Stevens grew up in Vermont, and in Vermont, there were very few African Americans that he came in contact with and almost no slavery in Vermont. So he did not form a whole lot of opinion about it prior to moving to Adams County. Adams County is a border county. It borders on the Mason-Dixon line. Just across the Mason-Dixon line, slavery was in full force and common in Maryland. In Gettysburg also, there were slaves held in Gettysburg at the time Stevens was present. The Pennsylvania Act of Gradual Abolition that occurred in 1780 allowed slavery to age out in Pennsylvania. So slaves were still walking the streets of Gettysburg. Stevens, as a young attorney, handled at least three cases against slaves early in his career, he lost all of them. So there was no recrimination. But in 1821, the Charity Butler case occurred. Charity Butler was uh, a slave who was born in Maryland. She belonged to a man named Norman Bruce, who eventually leased her to a guy named Cleland who eventually leased her to a seamstress named Mrs. Gilliland. 
Mrs. Gilliland from time to time would cross over the Mason-Dixon line into Pennsylvania and sew for people. She took Charity with her. Charity was about 11 years old. Charity watched Mrs. Cleland's child. However, Mrs. Cleland, Mrs. Uh, Gilliland's child. However, eventually, Mrs. Gilliland's marriage failed and she did not make enough money to keep Charity and feed her child and herself. So she gave her back to Norman Bruce. Norman Bruce sold her to a man named John Delaplane and Charity ran away. Charity came into Adams County, eventually met a guy named Henry Butler, a free black, got married, had two children, Harriet and Sophia. Eventually, John Dillaplane found out where Charity was living. In Adams County at that time, there were slave catchers, there were informants, there were people who would kidnap. John Delaplane came with his friends and kidnapped Charity and her two daughters back into Maryland. He lived in Frederick County. Henry Butler sued in Adams County Court to get the return of his wife and two daughters. In 1821, in April, the case came into Adams County Court. Henry Butler and his attorneys had a very flimsy case. They claimed that the act of abolition allowed for anyone who lived in Pennsylvania for six months with the express consent and knowledge of their owner became free. So they claimed that the times that Mrs. Gilliland brought charity into Pennsylvania added up to six months. Kind of sketchy. Then they claimed that because Mrs. Gilliland leased charity from Mr. Cleland, who leased charity from Norman Bruce, it was with Norman Bruce's consent. It's probable that Norman Bruce had no idea that this was happening. As a result, flimsy court case, Henry Butler, Charity Butler, Sophia Harriet lost. Thaddeus Stevens was the individual who was appearing for the slave owner, John Delaplane. Henry Butler and his attorney, James Dobbin, and John McConaughey appealed to the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court. The Supreme Court in Pennsylvania at that time was rotating locations, and that court at that time in October 1821 met in Chambersburg. Once again, Stevens appeared for John Delaplane, and once again, Henry Butler lost the case. That was their last hope when the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court denied their request. I think back and think about what must have happened in that courtroom when the verdict was read. The emotion of Henry Butler and Charity and her two daughters. Those children and, wife and mother were consigned to slavery possibly for the rest of their lives. It must have been heartrending. I think about what Thaddeus Stevens must have thought. He must have had incredible guilt because this was something that he was involved with. He caused those four people to lose the last hope that they had. I also think of John Delaplane also. Think of him. Here was a man who kidnapped three people in Pennsylvania and took them back to his plantation in Frederick County. Here was a man who knew that Charity had run away once. Such a man might well have sold her to a very southern plantation owner, selling them south so they would never be near the Mason-Dixon line ever again. It 
is unlikely that Henry Butler ever saw his family ever again. And it was noted when he died in the newspapers in 1840 that he had no family, we believe. What did Henry Butler also think after this court case was, was over? He was an active participant in the Underground Railroad. He did everything that he could to see that other fugitives could get away free. But it was a very complex time also because at the same time that Thaddeus Stevens was defending a slave owner, he was suing in Adams County Court for the freedom of three other African Americans who had been kidnapped back into Emmitsburg, Maryland. At the same time, this case he brought into Adams County Court in August of 1820, and in November of 1820, Thaddeus Stevens lost the case. But he found a technicality, and he asked the judge for a retrial, and the judge granted it. The second trial he tried, there was a hung jury. The third trial, there was a hung jury. The fourth trial, there was a hung jury. And finally, in 1822, Stevens won. After five jury trials, five, I would dearly love to know what Thaddeus Stevens said. We have the names of the 60 jurors that he preached liberty to, but we don't know what he said. In his book, Alexis de Tocqueville, the Frenchman in Traveling Through America, said that the, jur the jury trial in America is one of the foremost methods of changing opinion in America. And that's one of the things that Thaddeus Stevens was doing. He preached liberty to 60 Adams Countyans and eventually he won the freedom of three African Americans. After the Charity Butler case, Thaddeus Stevens never again def defended a slave owner against a slave or brought suit on behalf of a slave owner against a slave, never again. And for the next 47 years, he embarked on a crusade for equality, a crusade to end slavery, first at the local level, then at the state level, and eventually at the federal level. And eventually, he won. Actually, he was very much for impeachment before uh, it actually got enough support in Congress to actually go ahead. And his basic problem was with Andrew Johnson and, uh, was that even though Congress uh, was in command because it had a veto, it could override its veto, <clears throat> Johnson was still required uh, to actually implement the uh, policies. And these included like uh, appointing generals to overseeing the military uh, occupation of the South. And Johnson would uh, constantly be appointing military governors uh, that would be uh, Southern sympathizers. And so to remedy this, the Congress passed the Tenure Office Act, which they hoped would ensure that uh, the good Republican cabinet members would be retained. Uh, it basically prohibited uh, uh, Johnson from getting rid of those uh, Lincoln uh, holdovers uh, without getting Senate approval. Uh, but, uh, and, and it sort of centered around uh, Edward uh, Stanton, Ed, Edwin Stanton, Edward Stanton. Uh, and of course, uh, he fired Stanton 
and uh, that was what sparked the um, impeachment. But basically, uh, the uh, the the main reason for the impeachment was because Johnson was not following the direction of Congress. He was one of the managers of the impeachment. However, he was only months away from dying, and he was very sick, and the impeachment uh, relied more on Ben Butler uh, for the presentation. And a number of historians feel that if uh, Thaddeus Stevens been as vigorous as he had been in uh, previous years, he would have been able to win the impeachment, uh, which actually only failed by one vote. Thaddeus Stevens uh, had a tendency to be very, um, very um, radical <laughs> about his ideas about, and he would talk about extinction and wiping them out and so on and so forth but at the same time this was a man that was against the uh, death penalty and uh, actually at one point was going to uh, he offered to defend Jefferson Davis if he was brought up on treason charges on the basis that uh, Jefferson Davis uh, couldn't have been uh, guilty of treason because he was president of another nation that sort of uh, tied into the whole idea as to whether the South actually succeeded or not. Believe it or not, there was that debate whether they actually succeeded. But his idea was uh, to basically, and I think this stems from his early career as a teacher, he wanted to teach them a lesson. He wanted to take away the land from uh, the aristocrats and to redistribute it to the uh, freed blacks and the poor whites uh, so that they had a more of a yeoman uh, type, yeoman farmer type system rather than the aristocracy that uh, prevailed in the South. He wanted, despite his harsh language, he just wanted to make the South a uh, equal society. And, uh, you know, he just, and teach them a lesson. This is the location where historians, people with even a, a small interest in history, do come. It's funny, when we clean up the cemetery a couple times a year, we'll see people walk in and ask us what we're doing, and then we'll ask them, well, why are you here? And they're just strolling through, or maybe they came here specifically for Stevens. But it is amazing. They're from all over the country. You know, Northeast, uh, we had someone here from Boston the one year we were cleaning. We had someone from uh, Florida the one year we were cleaning. So it's always neat to have different people here just learning about Stevens. And if they don't know a lot about Stevens, it really is a nice opportunity for us to sit down with them and share the importance of Thaddeus Stevens. Because really, he's not in our history books at the level which he deserves. All the impact that he had in our country to this day and the legacy left at Thaddeus Stevens College of Technology where we graduate hundreds of students that are breaking the cycle of poverty, changing their lives, changing their communities. It's all because Th Stevens had that vision that people needed the opportunity to be treated equal, to have the access to an education and take advantage of what an education provides. He's, he is probably the least known great American in our history probably the least known. Now the Spielberg film helped erase some of that. Uh, as I look at that progression, in 1861, Thaddeus Stevens introduced a legislative piece into the United States Congress that would have effectively outlawed slavery didn't go anywhere. And gradually, people and he came to understand that he was a lightning rod. People might vote against that because they didn't like him. And so <clears throat> he changed strategies. He allowed a little known congressman from Ohio to introduce the legislation that in 1864 eventually became the 13th Amendment to the United States and was passed in 1865 by Congress. 
and then um, ratified by three quarters of the states. Now there was a little manipulation there. That legislation would never have passed had Southern congressmen still been sitting in the United States Congress. You had to have a two-thirds vote. But they weren't there anymore because they were in rebellion against the government. They weren't there. I saw the Washington Post did a survey which they published this past week. They counted 1,715 congressmen who either owned slaves during their term in office or had been slave owners. Had those congressmen, or any of them, been in Congress, it would, those, those amendments would never have passed. Had southern states been members of the Union in 1865, they would never have gotten ratification by three quarters of the states. The congressmen, the southern congressmen had to be out of Congress and the southern states had to not be part of the Union in order for those to pass. The time was right. The time was right. He was not a perfect man. He was flawed. But his goals were very high. His persistence allowed him to be one of the great people in American history. Make a big thank you to all of the people who have uh, contributed to the statue uh, and also to the people who contributed to promote or to hold this three-day celebration of Thaddeus Stevens uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, and also the people who contributed to help make this video. I hope that this uh, video and the dedication will uh, bring more people to realize the importance of Thaddeus Stevens uh, and to uh, hopefully support efforts to promote his memory.